All right. Welcome to Standing for Truth. Uh, this is going to be a video dealing with one of the uh, more uh, technical objections or criticisms to uh, biblical creation. And uh, guys, we're going to get right into it. We're going to get right into the, the fun. So what I want to do is uh, share screen here. And um, what we're going to be doing is... Many of these kinds of shorter videos where we are going to address a lot of the uh, issues and challenges in the creation versus evolution debate. And we are going to offer a, a variety of these kinds of uh, videos that are a little shorter than uh, some of the other videos we have focusing on this topic. For example, we have specifically dealt with this topic numerous times, uh, recombination rates. But we want to start taking some more of these, uh, some of these technical topics and uh, just offer the audience uh, shorter videos that essentially deal with these. And so you can easily refer to them when the... Uh, when the critics who are really, really good at uh, repeating already debunked talking points, when they bring it up, you can just show them uh, this video. So essentially this argument itself, the, the critics claim that there has been too much recombination to explain the origin of humanity in just thousands of years. Okay, the biblical model of ancestry would uh, start from the Bible. The Bible claims to be the history book of the universe, and uh, Genesis tells us that God created two people, Adam and Eve, just thousands of years ago. And uh, roughly 4,500 years ago, we have Noah, we have his wife, his three sons, their three sons, and three wives. So we would basically go back to those three, three couples. So uh, the critics, they'll say that this is impossible, though, because the way chromosomes cross over have to be taking place at extremely high rates, unrealistic rates, they would say, if biblical creation were true, this model that we're proposing here, separate ancestry. And um, a lot of this crossing over that, that creationists require is unrealistic to the point where they feel they can just kind of hand wave all of the amazing evidence that we do have for the design diversity hypothesis or the created heterozygosity model that we typically uh, talk about and, and discuss here. Now, um, what the creationist needs is recombination rates, orders of magnitude faster than is actually observed today. And basically the argument boils down to this, guys, okay? There is no way to account for all of the various combinations that exist today in just roughly four to 7,000 years. And we're gonna deal with that this here in about uh, 20 to 30 minutes worth of, of video. So let's get right into it. And uh, I do wanna point out though that the endogenous retrovirus handbook, dismantling the best evidence for common descent, it is, um, I'm delighted to say that it, it's pretty well done. We, we've sent it in for um, the first round of 
publishing. It, it came in nearly uh, uh, 200 pages. Guys, this book leaves no stone unturned, okay? As you can see here in the, uh, the cover and, and the back of the book, of course, uh, we are going to be answering the best challenges that the critics have to offer, the evolutionists have to offer on this, on this topic. What best explains ERV-like sequences found at the same locations in the genomes of different organisms? Why do ERV elements resemble viral genetic material? What is the best explanation for the nested hierarchical distribution of endogenous retroviral-like sequences in primate genomes, including the uh, distribution, the nested hierarchical distribution of the so-called mutations found in the structure or the properties of the ERV sequence themselves? So we are going to be dealing with that, both uh, forms of the nested hierarchy argument in this book. And uh, ultimately, and most importantly, can the separate ancestry model explain endogenous retroviruses better than common descent? The answer is yes. Um, this uh, book, the conclusions in this book, the testable predictions that I make have massive implications for the origins debate, the question of ancestry. And the critics are going to have a tough time with this because they're going to have to present a more superior model. And uh, these, these main challenges listed on the back of the book, uh, these are not the only ones I deal with this in this book. It's incredibly comprehensive. And uh, a reason why I bring it up is because uh, one chapter in this, highly comprehensive, is on the design diversity hypothesis. And um, I do deal with this argument in the book in great detail, actually, because it is really their, their number one argument against design diversity. So I thought it was important to spend some time on it in the book. And so when this comes out on June 1st, um, make sure to check out that section. Tons of references for you as well. And uh, since it's just a few of us here at the ministry, we've been pretty well focused. Matt's also uh, got a book he's working on. And so the last uh, month, we haven't had as many streams as we usually do, uh, mainly because it was... Uh, of utmost importance that, that we put all our focus, specifically myself, all my focus on, on this book, and it was worth it. So guys, we are putting out uh, content full time because of the uh, book here, which is pretty well done in publishing. Uh, we haven't been able to do that many streams. And so if you want to, if you want to be a financial backer for uh, Standing for Truth Ministries, check the description box uh, for as little as a dollar a month, for example, on uh, Patreon, you can be a Standing for Truth Ministries patron. And there's tons of exclusive contents there. You can also go to the uh, official website, sayingfortruthministries.com, and you can uh, help support us there. So here is the uh, secondary cover. This is for the uh, colored version of the book because we got some cool images. Um, Benjamin, who's done uh, previous work for me on uh, other books, and of course, the famous uh, superhero SFT logo. He's done another phenomenal job here. And we've also got some cool custom Im images in, in the book. So uh, yes, <laughs> that book does give the fatal blow to, uh, to endogenous retroviruses as evidence for a common descent. Okay, so let's just get right into it then. Recombination rates, debunking the critics. Guys, um, what you're going to want to know as we move forward addressing this argument is... What is recombination? Okay, recombination is a process by which pieces of DNA are broken and recombined to produce new combinations of alleles. This recombina recombination process creates genetic diversity at the level of genes that reflects differences in the DNA sequences of different organisms. Um, if if you've been following this channel for, for a while, you know that we uh, look to recombination in the design diversity model because... Uh, the design diversity model would would essentially suggest that Adam and Eve and, and the original created archetypes would have been front loaded with pre-existing DNA diversity and functional DNA elements, various classes of functional DNA elements. And these uh, endogenous retroviral like sequences would fall into those classes of, of created units of, of DNA function. And since 
the, the creationist model would say that the majority of DNA diversity, the majority of DNA differences that we see within species and across species were built in at creation. That means the creation model doesn't need millions and millions of years to build up the necessary genetic diversity for processes like recombination and gene conversion to become effective. The evolutionist requires mutations over time. A mutation adds genetic diversity because it's adding something that was not previously there. So over time, species build up these DNA differences as a result of mutation and recomb uh, re recombination can lead to new chromosomal uh, combinations. And uh, with the creation model, the DNA differences for the most part are already built in at creation. So we don't require time for adaptive episodes, for uh, speciation events, for new varieties to arise because simply due to a recessive trait, that was front loaded, we could have a new phenotype being manifested based on the pre existing capacity for these, these types of, of changes. But uh, we've, we've talked about that at great length, and we'll probably have a separate video on that as well. So I, I do want to move on here. And speaking of recombination, though, and we're going to go over a number of technical papers here. Recombination is not actually as random as it was once thought. It's kind of like these mutations. They've always thought, uh, for the most part, that mutations were generally random. Okay. Uh, but now we know, and I touch on this in, in the new ERV book, especially as it pertains to the um, nested hierarchical patterns in the distribution of these mutations in the structure of the ERV sequences themselves, um, mutations are not so random either. We actually see that, that these mutations um, are relatively non-random, just like uh, recombination is not as random as, as was once, once expected. And here's the thing there are there have been remarkable discoveries and developments in the realm of genetics and a lot of the arguments employed by the critics demonstrate a significant lack of ability okay to stay up to date on the latest research the latest discovery and the um latest technical papers that that are coming out. And again, you'll see that in, in the endogenous retrovirus handbook, I've got um, just countless references. Every single argument that, that I use in, in this argument is supported by the primary sources. Basically, endogenous retroviruses are demolished by the primary sources. And this argument is also demolished by the uh, by primary sources, okay? And um, there's this amazingly intricate DNA element that I want to focus on here for the bulk of, of the video and answering this problem, okay? As you can see here, PRDM9, a driver of the genetic map. Okay, this is very interesting here, this uh, specific excerpt from this, this paper. Most, if not all, Myotic recombination events are controlled by what? PRDM9. Most, if not all. Okay, this is going to be important to consider as, as we move on here because the PRDM9 enzyme, okay, it's designed to look for a specific set of, of letters on the chromosome. Okay, so what it does is it, uh, it looks for these letters, it grabs onto it, and then it recombines. And focusing here on the PRDM9, we actually know that, which is why I want to go to the next slide here, we actually know that Africans have more of these sites than Europeans. We understand that the PRDM9 DNA elements are drivers of what? Of genetic landscapes. Okay, notice this paper here, the landscape of recombination in African Americans. We have shown that the PRDM9 alleles that bind a novel 17 BP motif and uh, occur at greatly increased frequency in people of West African ancestry have led to a shift in the recombination landscape compared with people of non-African ancestry. The larger number of hotspots available to West Africans implies that at the population level, 
crossovers are more evenly distributed than in Europeans. And thus, the shorter extent of West African linkage disequilibrium is not due to uh, differences in demographic history alone, such as the lack of an out-of-Africa founder event. So this entire argument employed by the critics and um, most of the arguments as they pertain to out of Africa versus out of Babel, which I've dealt with extensively on this channel in books and in articles, are um, based on a number of really faulty and erroneous assumptions. Okay, we know from the technical literature that the PRDM9 gene regulates, controls, and influences recombination through hotspots. More recombination per generation means a population has the capability of holding or retaining more diversity. Populations undergoing more recombination will consist of what? They will consist of more pieces of DNA. Okay? If you have population A and population B, and population A has more fully operational PRDM9 DNA elements, okay, then that population like we see in Africans are going to be able to harbor more levels of genetic diversity. And defenders of evolutionary theory, critics of biblical creation, they will then look at what appears to be a lot of recombination over time, okay? And wrongfully assume that this is a reflection of age, of deep time, when in fact it's not. Okay, it's due to the amount of recombination. And again, here, this is an important paper to consider that Africans generally have more of, of these sites and hot spots than, than Europeans. Okay, so let's move on here. PRDM9 gene and recombination. One thing I want to point out, though, that, that kind of just came to mind is this is such a, a funny argument to me because what we actually know is within the, the human genome, there exists massive, massive blocks of DNA, these massive linkage blocks that appear as if they've never been recombined. Okay, they are largely intact. Now, wait a minute. If we've been evolving for millions and millions of years, where you know you, you start with the Australopithecine, Australopithecine-like ancestors, up to um, you know Homo habilis, up to Homo erectus, who you know. Uh, lives all over the globe for for a, a million plus years, and then eventually, you know, Homo sapiens, sapiens, and then eventually, uh, people spread out in in all parts of the world. Well, that's millions of years, basically, of uh, mutations accumulating every single generation. Okay, mutations adding genetic diversity because, as we covered earlier, a mutation adds something that was not previously there. It's adding genetic diversity. Now, is it beneficial diversity? No, it's uh, harmful diversity in the sense that it's the type of uh, variation you get on your car when over time the car rusts out. Or you just got a brand new car and you drive off the lot and you go park at the grocery store and you want to pick up some groceries for the family and the person next to you opens the door, smacks it into your brand new car and now you got a nice dent. Well, sure, you know, that dent has uh, created variation in your car, but it's not beneficial uh, variation. The type of variation you get basically from uh, mutations is the, the rust marks, the dings, and the dents that, that you get on your car. Okay, but nonetheless, these mutations are still adding genetic diversity, but every single generation you are getting recombination. OK, so you're getting a scrambling of, of these DNA variants each generation. And so today we wouldn't expect to see these these large linkage blocks relatively intact, showing evidence th that they've never recombined in, in the first place. OK, this actually speaks to the youth of the genome. Evolutionists can't explain this. Okay, evolutionists look to a post hoc ad hoc uh, story, this uh, hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck that doesn't work. They use that to explain why humans today have uh, such low genetic diversity. Every single human being, 99.99% uh, similar when it comes to uh, why there, there appears to be a lack of recombination. If deep time evolution were true, you know, they'll look to this idea of cold spots and hot spots within the genome in terms of recombination. 
and um, which has a, a level of truth to it. But nonetheless, given what we still see in terms of these largely intact uh, blocks of DNA, it's more of a problem for the evolutionist, the deep time evolutionist, than it is for a young earth creationist. So where they say we have a problem, the point I'm trying to make is they're the ones that have a problem. The initial discovery of PRDM9's role in the recombination process, determining the location of recombination hotspots in many mammals, including humans and mice, opened intense study of this protein's properties and functions. We now understand that during meiosis, PRDM9 binds DNA at particular recognition sequences. Remember I was talking uh, earlier how uh, this uh, very intricate DNA element, okay, this PRDM9 enzyme, it looks for a specific set of letters on the chromosome, it grabs onto it, and then it, it recombines, leading to um, genetic diversity. So, uh, th this is very interesting to know that recombination is not as random as as was once thought. OK, and uh, here reorganizes the local chromatin environment by methylating adjacent nucleosomes. Marks hot spots for eventual DSB formation facilitates the translocation of activated hot spots to the chromosome axes where DSB formation occurs. And this is then required to assure proper repair of the DNA breaks. Notice this, as a res result, PRDM9 plays a key role in determining patterns of genetic segregation. So you can't assume that what we're looking at in terms of these sections of DNA, okay, and uh, assume that this is indicative of time because the the secular literature, the primary sources actually refute that. That is a um, false assumption. Okay. There are a lot of factors at play when it comes to levels of genetic diversity, when it comes to um, recombination events. So again, PRDM9 plays a key role in determining patterns of genetic segregation and linkage as well as influencing the possibilities for chromosome reorganization over successive generations. In Africa, where people clearly have a more functional PRDM9 gene and more recombinational hotspots, we see more rounds of what? Recombination. And as a result, a more shuffled genome. That's what we see. A human population that has evidence for more rounds of recombination, more effective recombination, Okay, they have higher levels of ge genetic diversity generally than non-Africans, and yet they have more of these sites, okay, more of these, these hot spots. Okay, let's keep going. PRDM9, an essential DNA element in recombination. PRDM9 is a meiosis-specific protein that trimethylates H3K4 and controls the activa activation of recombination hot spots. The more of these hotspots, or, or the more of these um, DNA elements, PRDM9, because we know over time they, they break down. Hey, it's much easier to break down a functional DNA element like this than to build one up, especially from scratch. So over time, they break down. Over time, the genome accumulates mutations. I mean, um, the rate right now in humans is roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation. That is pretty high. Um, some estimates are even more. Disruption, notice this, this is where we get into it. Disruption of the PRDM9 gene results in sterility in mice. So when you actually disrupt these, these sites due to mutations, they, they have harmful effects. They can lead to disease, sterility, less effective recombination. In human, several PRDM9 SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, have been implicated in sterility as well. Okay, and as we can see in the above excerpt, the disruption of the PRDM9 gene has significant implications for the overall health of organisms. And as we know, and the evidence suggests, very powerful evidence, the design diversity hypothesis makes a number of uh, very interesting testable predictions, including predictions on DNA function. If you were to go, right, the creationist looks back in time to the expansion of genetic information. 
the expansion of the genome. The evolutionist looks back in time to the contraction of genetic information. They go back billions of years ago to their single celled like ancestor that evolved into a multi celled ancestor that evolved into a fish, a, an amphibian, a reptile, a mammal, a monkey, you know, a man eventually. So uh, evolutionary theory requires mutations over time, adding genetic diversity and genetic variation. Natural selection can act upon this genetic variation or according to them, neutral mutations can build up and act as a hidden reservoir of, uh, you know, uh, novel change that um, epigenetics obviously comes into play as well. Um, but for another day, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. But the creationist looks back to the expansion of genetic information. So at creation, you have the most heterozygous ancestors. When you start with heterozygous ancestors, that means you start with the potential, the pre-existing capacity for novel phenotypic change, okay? Massive uh, capabilities for uh, a wide range of morphological adaptability. Um, chromosomal uh, combinations, new chromosomal combinations can, can come about quickly. So you'd have a, a greater amount of uh, heterozygosity. You'd have more of these uh, endogenous retroviral-like elements, these variation-inducing genetic elements that have not experienced mutations. There would have been no mutations at creation. These DNA differences would have been a reflection of initial design initial design and not mutations. The evolutionists, unfortunately, and a lot of the critics that employ this argument, they are arguing from their own starting point. They are not representing our position accurately because at creation, you also would have more fully operational, fully working PRDM9 sites and therefore more effective recombination. Okay, gene uh, conversion itself would be uh, more effective as well. We know gene conversion helps in, in breaking up these these variants okay and it would be expected based on our model that god would have front loaded these design dna variants in areas within the genome that can experience effective recombination and scrambling that would lead to uh novel diversity genetic diversity really in a, in a single generation okay and um for people who um are new to this channel when i use the word heterozygous or homozygous um Created heterozygosity just means a state of DNA diversity. And the technical uh, definition of the word heterozygous is having two different alleles of the same gene or locus. Uh, locus or, or loci would be a, a specific location uh, in the DNA itself. And then homozygous is having two of the same alleles, the, the, the identical alleles in the um, of the same gene or, or locus. So... Um, created heterozygosity would mean that the original created archetypes would have been um, designed with pre-existing levels of DNA diversity, hence the uh, design diversity model. So um, let's kind of let's kind of recap a little bit. A larger gene pool at the creation in the pre-flood world, especially because at the flood, we have a genetic bottleneck. At Babel, we have a bit of a bottleneck as well, which would reduce levels of heterozygosity, not as much as the critics say, because it was a one generation bottleneck followed up by rapid and exponential population growth. So very limited or very little of that original heterozygosity would be, would be lost. But nonetheless, the pre-flood world, and obviously the closer you, you get to creation, you're gonna have a, a more expanded uh, gene pool and uh, more healthier genes overall since mutations have not accumulated as much as mutations have, have accumulated today and as a result have eroded a lot of these uh, PRDM9 sites. And unfortunately, I, I've even seen um, some from on our, our own side who should know better, some creationists who should know better. They've been studying this for years and years and years. But unfortunately, there are some creationists that uh, would rather concede what seems to be every single point to the evolutionist. And uh, one specific critic brought up this argument. You know, there's no way for, according to the design diversity model, for uh, biblical creationists to account for the number of recombination events or, or crossover events, I should say, that uh, have occur occurred. Uh, seemingly when, when examining the genome. And yet we have a, a, a very ready answer, a very strong answer that, that leads to uh, the predictions and retrodictions. And it's the evolutionist that has the greater problem since there doesn't seem to be enough scrambling. 
If we've been evolving for millions of years, then the genome should have been scrambled into nothingness. And yet we still see these large blocks of DNA that are intact to the point where they look like they haven't experienced any recombination in the history of, of, of this planet. Okay. So this argument, it just, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. A, a greater gene pool, more uh, fully operational PRDM9 sites, because we do know that mutations break them down over time. We know that today Europeans have less than Africans, for example. And um, that would mean more effective recombination, more snips of DNA uh, throughout the genome. Okay, so that doesn't automatically insinuate that we're dealing with deep time here that this population has uh, been around longer. And it really is just an unsophisticated argument. And it doesn't consider the fullness of the technical data that we've been going over here. Here's another uh, couple technical papers you can look at. Recombination regulator, uh, PRDM9 influences the instability of its own coding sequences in human. Um, here's another one that deals with uh, the recombination hotspots. And... Uh, here's an important slide as well from this paper, PRDM9 and its role in genetic recombination. Guys, these sites have broken down over time. Mutations are accumulating and the evidence suggests, and I, uh, there's going to be no question, no doubt in the um, objective reader's mind when they read this new book that's coming out on endogenous retroviruses, there will be no doubt that uh, the entire junk DNA paradigm is dead. I deal uh, comprehensively and technically with all their best so-called arguments, objections, criticisms, the ones that want to maintain this indefensible junk DNA paradigm, indefensible. And I deal with it in great detail. Like I said, it's it's roughly 170 pages, this book, dozens and dozens of, of technical uh, papers. And it really does uh, demonstrate why uh, the junk DNA paradigm is, is bankrupt. As a result, endogenous retroviruses are refuted since they are part of the uh, greater junk DNA argument. And uh, common descent just completely overturned. Separate ancestries making the best uh, testable predictions and testable predictions that are confirmed more and more every day, especially in the world of DNA function. So uh, PRDM9 influences the possibility of genetic exchange, genetic exchange by determining the locations of meiotic recombination hotspots in most mammals. Remember the, um, the paper earlier that we uh, cited right here, PRDM9, a driver of the genetic map, and yet they want to look at these genetic landscapes of different populations and conclude that based on the genetic landscapes of let's say uh, African populations, they are older when in fact that is not indicative of age. And there's a number of factors that they're not considering here. Most, if not all meiotic recombination events are controlled by what? PRDM9. And it just so happens to turn out that Africans have more of these. Notice this, the larger number of hotspots available to West Africans implies that at the population level, crossovers are more evenly distributed than in Europeans. And another thing too is, as you have uh, people groups moving into Africa after um, the Babel event, if you have people groups moving into Africa that have more fully working, fully operational PRDM9 sites, and um, more of these hotspots as well for the uh, PRDM9 DNA element to uh, look for, grab onto and recombine, leading to more and more uh, scrambling and, and DNA diversity, then guess what? The African genetic landscape is going to have a, have a different manifestation than non-African genetic landscapes. And that's exactly what we see when we compare um, Africans and non-Africans. To do so, it uses its zinc finger array to bind specific DNA sequences. Pre-existing chromatin structure influences which of PRDM9's DNA binding sites are available for use in vivo. So again, PRDM9 and its role in genetic recombination. So what I'll do, guys, is um, put some of these papers in the in, in the description box. Um, this is an argument that that's repeated. This is an argument that has been invalidated. And um, what I want to do is 
is is focused more on on these kinds of uh, challenges and arguments to our uh, position and i will um put together more presentations like this keep them between uh you know 30 45 minutes and um i'm looking at the time here and we're just at the 35 minute mark guys so share this around the truth is important even their very best technical challenges criticisms arguments to the biblical model of ancestry um they have answers and uh, sometimes you just got to seek them out and that's what we are here to do at standing for truth uh, we focus on defending the truth of biblical creation. So everybody, God bless. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope you enjoyed this video.